you know what I'm thinking about. Yeah, Joey. Joey De Francesco. Yeah, man. Yeah. One take. One take. Yeah. One yeah. take, of yeah. course, it is. And uh, yeah. there's, there's a little video on YouTube, isn't there? It's, uh, like, yeah, I guess there's a couple. That, that thing was really funny. There's a guy, a uh, great musician in Toronto named Peter Cardinelli. He's got a company called Alma Records. And he approached, uh, he knew Joey, and he knows this great drummer in Toronto named Vito Retza, and a great trumpet player who's sort of a Canadian icon. Uh, by the name of Guido Basso. Yeah. And he decided to sort of like, and then he asked me if I wanted to do it. He had this right. idea of uh, a series of recordings called One Take, where you get people that haven't really played together. He did four of them, right? In yeah, I, yeah, I think so, yeah, yeah. So anyway, we were the guinea pigs. We were the first ones. So we got together at this studio in Toronto, and I had met Joey like, you know, 20 minutes before we played. We right. figured, For the we first just, time. Yeah, ever, right. yeah. So that's why, I mean, it had that kind of thing, uh, that sort of vibe uh, or context where, you know, in the old days, people would get together and sometimes they wouldn't even rehearse. They would call tunes if it was like a blowing session or something. Sure. Anyway, it was essentially like that. And um, I've heard some of it and it's, you know, for what it is, it sounded pretty good. It sounds amazing. Yeah. Well, it's just, yeah, it's just four guys calling tunes. Yeah. Yeah. And Joey was amazing. Like right. he's, you know, he plays saxophone and trumpet too. Yeah. No, of course. Yeah. And yeah. sings. Yeah, uh, saxophone is quite recent. I think it? so. Yeah, yeah. like he, he's just, he sounds great already. No, I mean it's it's he's a marvel. He's an absolute <laughs> yeah. marvel. And yeah. his trumpet play. He has a trumpet that he got from Miles Davis when he was a teenager. Is that right? Yeah, we were on this gig one time. It wasn't the recording. He picked up the trumpet and he started playing Olio right with his you know, right hand, obviously. And then he got to the bridge and he walked this killer bass line <laughs> while he's playing. Well, well, he well he, on the Miles recording there was no it was just like rhythm section, right? There, you know, in the original, and he was always walking the bass line, and then he plays the head again like the last day, then he starts playing a, a killer trumpet solo with the mute on, and he starts walking a bass line, so you're doing do 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 do, and you're at the same time. That's incredible. I mean, I I was. I was dumbfounded, yeah. <laughs> there's something about those organ players, isn't there? I'm sure there's something different in their brains. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, through repetition, like, you know, piano players sort of do that, not so much with bass lines, but with comping and stuff. Sure. But, uh, yeah, it would, uh, it would take an awful lot of work to develop that kind of independence. Yeah, sure. You know? But, uh, yeah, he's, he's a marvel. You sound great on that album, by the way. Thank you. It's, uh, it was fun. It was, it was very loose and very relaxed, which was, which was great. Nothing to read. Right. No intricate arrangements right. with like, you know, eight, you know, five bar sections and, you know, yeah. whatever. But. Like last night. Yeah, that, that's that, well, that suite of Kirk's, we played it a, a couple times during, and I had never seen the music before. I mean, I saw, I got it a bit in advance of the tour, but then we sort of, it sort of came together like as we played it. Yeah. You know, and that was very, that's very, very. You've played it Ronnie Scott's before though, I take it. Me? Yeah. No. Really? No, I've never played that's, it. No. That's a travesty. Well, it's outrageous. It's a wonderful man. You know, when I walked in there, I thought, "What a beautiful club!" Yeah. I mean, it's just a lovely place. Like the main floor is is lovely. And when and uh, you were kind enough to give me that jam session with Andy last time I was here upstairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He still talks about that. Yeah. 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 Were you doing a duo last night? We were, yeah. yeah we're, you do that regularly there with him? Or? Andy's there every. No, I know that, but like he calls me once a month for it. Yeah, yeah. But that's cool. Like playing, a, I, I've I've done a fair bit of duo playing with. Uh, with Kirk, right through many, you know, I've known Kirk for over forty years, and Neil and Brian, the piano player. Um, yeah, Kirk and I've been playing duo off and on for a long, long time. Right, right. Yeah, he's an incredible player. Yeah. So, how do you how do you approach that? I mean, I, I guess, I guess um, you know what with uh, uh, you know Joe Pass popping up in the seventies, it kind of sort of set a kind of benchmark for solo guitar mm, playing. Uh, yeah, but, but that's not your. Yeah, I mean, I love Joe's playing. I, my, my, one of my main heroes, one of many, but one of my principal heroes is Bill Evans. Okay. And I love the way he plays. When he plays solo piano, he alludes to different things. Sure. You know, the idea is, you know, if you play like uh, some linear ideas, and then of course you for you know for contrast or whatever, or to sort of punctuate it, you do a little bit of comping, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a full chord. Sure. And then, you know, plus he's, you know, on the piano, I mean, it's laid out for that because you've got two hands, but you can, there's way, I'm still working on it, but there's ways of approximating stuff like that. Like, I'm just thinking of an example, if I, if I went like, um,
So what happens is I wasn't very, you know, I was just a, a you know, not a great example, but <laughs> well, it was fantastic. No, no, but I mean, the idea is you you want to be able to play things on three different levels whenever you want. Right. You know, uh, if I'll do like if I. So it's sort of, yeah. I'm trying to sort of, um, I'm trying to approach it the way a piano player might do that by breaking up the time and assigning different things at different times. Sure. You know, like linear harmonic and bass sort of. That's fantastic. And yeah, I mean, it's again, it's, um, uh, I never have anything worked out, so sometimes it's a bit more successful than others, but that's that's the goal. Sure. You know, um, rather than rather than sort of laying down a complete bass line. And, yeah, and, yeah. I mean, yeah, well, yeah. like, yeah, I mean, there were people like Ted Green and other people that said, now, when you do that, I mean, it has to be worked out like a classical piece because, you know, there's very specific fingerings and things like that. Yeah. And I, I don't have the time or the desire really to do something quite like that. You've got friends as well to, 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 to do that stuff. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. But it's an interesting way to, to uh, and, and I practice a lot like that when I'm at home. I, you know, sometimes we, you know, as a guitar as guitar players, sometimes we can sit around and just play lines all day, sure, and practice some different conceptual ideas and stuff like that. But it's nice to bring other things into the fold and try and make it a little bit more complete. You know, like I tell my students, a, a really good way to learn a tune, if you really want to know everything there is to know about a tune, learn to try and play a solo version of it. And then if all of a sudden a bass player shows up, you can, re, you know, you remove the bass notes yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're left with the other uh, two factors. And then all of a sudden a singer horn player shows up. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then all of a sudden now you're sort of in the middle zone in a way. So yeah, you've got yeah, somebody yeah. taking care of the lead line, sure. the bass. And I found that very challenging, especially when I was younger. I mean, the master of that, uh, that kind of accompaniment is Ed Bicker. Right. And the interesting thing about Ed is that when I first started listening to him and didn't know a whole lot of tunes, as I learned more repertoire, I would start noticing more and more that his accompaniment was like a background, almost like a like um, an arrangement of a, of a tune. Right. In other words, his, there'd be a melodic component to his comping. Sure. For, for an, exa an example is on the, um, the Pure Desmond album. Yes, I know that. Album. You know when they do uh, "Just Squeeze Me." Yeah, and they get to the end of the first eight. Uh, you know, um, you know, and, and then and then Ed, and then Paul Desmond just goes, and Ed goes, and that he goes like one. That's I won't dance. Don't yeah, ask yeah, me. Absolutely. So he took a melody from somewhere else and he harmonized it on the fly. It's yeah. like instant like arrangement. Of tunes that will relate to what is happening at yeah. the so, time. So, so tell me, how old were you when you first started? What I mean, at this at this point, when you were listening right. to Ed, I heard Ed in. Um, well, you know what? Actually, I knew about Ed, and I heard him play a little bit with uh, this famous Canadian saxophone player named Mo Kaufman. He played regularly in his band at this place called George's Spaghetti House. Okay. In the, oh, well, probably the seventies. Probably okay. even much earlier than that. You know, in, probably in, in Toronto. In Toronto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they had a musical association for many years before, but when I first got into jazz, it was probably around. Uh, well, let's see, when I was sixteen, it was around 1970, 71, I went up to Ed Bickert at a club, a different club in Toronto. Uh, I was sixteen, and I, I was just sort of getting interested, and in, I was still a rock and roll player, and I went up to Ed and I. I asked him if he gave lessons, and he said no. He was very, he was very uh, um, he wasn't short with with me or anything, but he uh, he was a man of few words. Right. So if he had nothing to say, he really wouldn't say anything. So then you fast forward 
what, 10 years later? And well, uh, maybe slightly more. well, what happened was, so in 74, a little bit later, I went, then I took some lessons and they weren't really working for me because it was more about like just going, you know, like just playing scales yeah, and learning sure. really basic things. It wasn't, it didn't have much to do with jazz. So, um, and then uh, a couple years went by and I was just jamming with friends and whatnot, trying to learn some repertoire. And in 1974, the Pure Desmond album came out. Right. And I'll never forget, I was actually at a friend of mine, fr my oldest friend, his name's Shelley Bruner. I've known him for over 50 years. We were at his parents' cottage and we heard a radio, uh, just north of Toronto. And we heard this radio broadcast from Toronto and it was Squeeze Me. Right. And I heard the guitar and I just thought, my God, you know, and it's not the kind of thing that would, if you're into like John McLaughlin or people that, that play quite often using copious amounts of notes, which is fine, Ed was the antithesis of sure. that. Plus the thing that really got me was the comping yeah. and his chord solos yeah. and the economy of the line. Sure. And then, like as I was saying, and then as I started to learn more tunes, I started hearing in his solos, it was like he was re weaving this tapestry of different melodies. Yeah. And it was completely organic. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like going to hear someone and they start quoting a tune, then they look for reaction from the audience, like right. a crowd pleaser. It was just like, it was all, all uh, like the entire intent was like just pure music. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And you know, so you hear a little bit of this thing here, then you hear a little bit of there. Sure. Like in the same tune in the chord soul, he went, he went like, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's like a quote from The Sidewinder yeah, by yeah. Lee Morgan. And it just went on and on and on yeah. on all these tunes. And I went, my God, that's that's that tune. Yeah. But he's playing it on that tune. So, I, yeah. I mean, I, I guess uh, as as a guitarist, you know, I, 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 like I, uh, the first time you hear Ed, Ed Bickett, it grabs you. And, and I think part of the reason it grabbed me was that because all of those cool, cool little notes were yeah. happening simultaneously. You know, they're not strummed. So they're all, it's some kind of... I presume some kind of, well, they call it claw hammer. Yeah, sometimes. yeah, or, or I guess some people refer to that as a hybrid technique. In other words, okay. it's not all plectrum and it's not all fingers. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, he held the pick in the usual way and then used his other three fingers. Yeah, and, I mean, that that, yeah. that that had a massive effect on me, you know. To, to well, I think at the time, I mean, that was uh, that was probably, uh, to comp that way was revolutionary because like everybody, it was all pick. Sure. You know, and then sometimes you get that. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if yeah, you had yeah, the yeah. older guitars with the high action and stuff, you know, where you, you get something, you know, like. You hear that, you know, you hear that. You yeah, hear yeah, that yeah, as yeah, almost yeah. as much as you hear the notes. Yeah. But also, those guitars were set up differently too. They were acoustic guitars with pickups right. on them. So the action was higher and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm in total agreement. And it, and it, it, it means you can place your chords much more incisor-like mm -hmm. very, very quickly. I also quickly. have more dynamic control. Yeah. I, yeah. I find, yeah, yeah. But totally. Yeah, so. But. Yeah. Oh, maybe we should play something. Yeah, actually. sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Want to um, play alone together maybe? So, yeah, okay. Okay. Why don't you play a bit, bit of solo? Okay. Alone together, and then we'll see what happens when, when I come. Okay. In. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it'll just be a continuation. Here, yeah. Right.
fun man masterful oh, great i don't know about that but but it's nice to not have my head buried in music yeah right yeah, it was yeah it was a, a great week but uh, oh, yeah brilliant brilliant i mean it's uh, yeah i'm absolutely knocked out man it sounds absolutely oh, amazing. Oh, the oh, control you. you know that you have over you know it's, well i don't know these they're these are feeling a little stiff now but as we go along they'll loosen up so 